Hey everybody, I'm Ivonix, and this is a demo for an upcoming indie game called A Case of Distrust. It's a sort of a film noir deal, so uh, I thought I would check it out. Let's begin. It's, uh, I woke in my desk chair. Across from me were his piercing amber eyes. They surprised me at first, but I should have known he'd be there. I stretched and said, mid-yawn, not very nice to sneak into a sleeping woman's apartment, but his stare just continued. I laughed at his glare, or I cursed the open window. I laughed at his glare. I'd seen San Francisco's shrewd thugs, hardened cops, and deadly politicians, but none could ever match that gaze. I knew I didn't have what he wanted. Oh my, switchblade. I knew he didn't- I didn't have what he wanted. Reaching into my coat, I took out my knife and flicked it open. I gave him the knife. I don't know who this person is yet. I held the knife steady. Good heavens. I held the knife steady while staring back at him. Look, I said, nodding towards the desk. That's all there is. Take it or leave it. But a detective knows when she's beat. And I knew then. He wanted to search the place, and that's what he would do. I sighed, knowing my weakness for his type. All right, I said, let's look. Liking, oh, kitty cat. I'm liking the, the whole visuals, and, like visual style and everything. He let out a gleeful, a gleeful meow in victory. Oh, the, it's a cat. It's a fucking cat. It's not a person. Oh, yeah. I cut a piece of my apple that the cat had rejected. Always in this, always the sore winner, I jabbed. But I was smiling too because I was telling the truth. There was absolutely no other food in my apartment. That is, that is funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> the cat often dropped by to scavenge. He made a lot of noise when I thought, when he thought I was holding out on him. But right now the place was clean, empty, no food anywhere. I had to prove it to him. Oh. This is so cool! Okay, let's look at the kitty. The cat had waltzed into my apartment a few years earlier. He kept coming back, though there was rarely a morsel to eat. He'd continue his loud meowing until I proved to him the place was empty of food. Doesn't matter how doe-eyed you are, cutie pie. We've got no food around, I told him. He licked his chops and looked at me. Apparently he still didn't believe that. I needed to contradict him somehow, to show him something in the apartment that would prove it was empty of food. Contradict or go back? Okay. I went back to the apartment to search for clues that I could show to him. Huh. What's this bird statue here? I kept the small statue underneath the side table. It had been police evidence in a crime, and its owner hadn't wanted it back. I took a shine to it, so I snagged it for myself on my way out of the department. Packaged cigarettes were the latest trend, but I still preferred to roll my own. The ashtray was evidence that it was an, a practice skill. I suppose I had a lot of free time back then. The lamp had belonged to my uncle, Lewis. He'd been an SFPD officer, one who argued one who argued police women could be good detectives, even while others jeered at me. I knew he'd been right, but my current workload didn't help that claim. I thought about Lewis. I thought about Lewis more often than I wanted. I was lousy at handling the emotions behind those thoughts. Hmm. Presumably Uncle Lewis is not around anymore. That is a lot of papers, it looks like. I had taken copies of old murder cases from the S uh, SFPD records when I had left. I loved reading through them, even though my own contributions were minimal. At that time, I longed for those types of jobs. The truth was, any work was hard to find for a female detective. Okie dokie. What's that on the ground? A newspaper was flopped on the floor, its headline about the death of Lenin, leader of the Red Menace sweeping Russia. It seemed the Bolsheviks had lost their head. My old notebook, now filled to the brim, I wrote everything down, even minor details. Never know it can be useful. The first half had my old cases. Details from the beats I used to walk in my policewoman days. Of course, police were forbidden from going on patrol. Police women were forbidden from going on patrol, but Lewis often overlooked that rule. Okay. Oh, I can't, I can't, uh, see what she would have said if I picked the other option. Oh, hmm. It's too bad. Do I have any notes yet? 
There were no cases just then, but the cat was mewing and needed attention. I had to contradict the cat, first by talking to him, then pointing to a piece of evidence in my notebook that proved the apartment was empty of food. Goals. Show the cat there's no food. Evidence. Okay. Statements. No statements yet. Um, right. Oh, what's in there? The regular white ice box, tinged yellow with age, half blocked in the ki half blocked the kitchen doorway. My income rarely kept much stocked in it, and right now it was empty. Maybe that's my evidence, is the empty ice box. What's this? The door to the outside world. If I left now, though, the cat would start wailing so loud I'd get complaints from the neighbors. No, he needed convincing before I could leave. Okay. Let's go talk to Mr. <laughs> Kitty Cat again. Alright, I have no food. So we can try to contradict him. By showing him the evidence of the ice box, right? I opened the ice box so the cat could see inside. Empty, I told him. The cat looked quizzically at the open door, then back at me. Sorry, fella, there's no grub in there for me either. He stared at me with eyes as disappointed as I felt. Those big yellows always got to my soul. Thoughts filled my thoughts of my family filled my head. My sister, my parents, but never mind. My sister! Muriel had sent a letter with an update of her life in Chicago. She and her husband had just purchased a new home outside the bluster of the city. Their three young children were looking forward to the move. I never told Muriel, but those letters kept me going. Hearing about my family, however remote, helped me cope with the isolation I was feeling. I refused to accept it myself back then, but perhaps Muriel had known anyway. My sister had the ordinary lifestyle that I'd rejected. I'd wanted to change the world. Let's be idealistic. I want to change the world to bring justice for victims, especially the ones who no longer had a voice. Not that I was helping advance that cause with the types of cases coming in my way. My mind spiraled into the usual series of questions. Had I even impacted the women's movement? Had I made any change on society at all? Was my plotting career worth losing traditional happiness? What was the point in, life, in the life I had chosen? A loud meow from the cat snapped my thoughts back into the moment. I took a deep breath and grinned back at him. Guess you can scram now, I said. Nobody's gonna come knocking with food for you, fella. But somebody is knocking on the door. There immediately came a banging on the front door. Beyond a nuisance, the cat was psychic, too. You order out? I asked him. Oh, dear. In the doorway was the regrettably familiar face of Connor Green. Yeah, look at that. Look, that, that looks like the smirk of a douchebag. I stared at him. I looked past him. His company churned my stomach. Like the... <laughs> Finger snaps. I stared at him. What do you want? A hired hand for whomever needed a job done. But Green snitched. Whenever he was put in a squeeze, working the beats, I remembered that all too well. Remarkably, the underground had been blind to it, but Green wasn't particularly ass assiduous. I was certain the criminal ranks would eventually plug him. He looked at me through the doorway with a coy smile. Well, ain't you gonna invite me inside? I started closing the door. <laughs> but he stuck out a foot to stop me. Hey now, he chided. Foul way to treat, to treat a customer alone. Is our first name Molly? Um, <laughs> so that was his angle, hiring me as a detective. I wondered what a blood -like, blood -like bootlegger would need with a private eye, but he answered without my prompt. I'll make this quick. I can't take this to the hog house, or the pigs would laugh me out. And other dicks just aren't as tempting, his grin widened. Thought this was going to be quick, I said, as I started rolling a cigarette. It wasn't quick, and I'd already rolled and lighted a second smoke when Green finally finished his story. I noted the important bits in my book. It had started with a letter, slipped under his door in a white envelope. The envelope contained a single typewritten leaf, which he handed to me. It read, End your game or we'll end you. It had no signature, instead ending only with, with only a small scribble in the bottom right corner that resembled a black hand. Oh dear. Green had led a new rum-running scheme. Had a lead on a new rum-running scheme, a connection from Vancouver. He'd given a sample to Tiny Paul, the gangster who ran the Tin Spoon Speakeasy for mob boss Jerry Ferry. Jerry Ferry. <laughs> They'd agreed to buy in for more. Green surmised the letter was about his rum-running. He suspected Redstone Stable, another bootlegger, of sending the letter. He told me that Stable ran a barber shop during the day and gave me the address. 
screening to know who the threat was from, he'd get Paul's gang to deal with them and continue his scheme to get rich. If I go snooping myself, he concluded, folks, see I'm not trusting people. No trust leads to no customers. I need to play it, play it low key, which is where you come in. I raised an eyebrow and stared at him through the cigarette smoke. Something in his yarn was still twisted. He must have noticed my ret reticence, because he said, You know, I worked closely with Lewis. I'm sure he'd want to protect me as much as any other victim. My uncle. Lewis had put me on the force. I'd finally accepted Lewis's death. Yeah. I was still searching for answers. Well, it sounds like we're still searching for answers. After his death, he'd been a man obsessed with helping victims and bringing justice to those beyond salvation. With that ethos, I never understood how he could have taken his own life. Those thoughts haunted me. I'd quit the SFPD and started my own practice, taking his philosophy. Was Green worth my time? Would he be worth Lewis's? Green had tipped off my uncle in a few cases. I wondered if that was, an if that was enough to warrant my protection. Before I could think past my headache, he threw a bill in my lap. Keep the C-note as a retainer. And don't worry about getting in touch. I'll find you later for a chat. He turned down the hallway, and I let him go. If he was willing to give me a hundred bucks with no, co with no commitment, I wouldn't stop him. I turned back to the apartment. My confu still confused about the whole story. My headache wasn't helping either. Whenever I lacked... Whenever I, I lacked clarity, a trip to Southern Coffee was usually the cure. Alright, let's go get some coffee. I'd mounted a gold plate on the outside that read, P.C. Malone, Private Investigator. There was only one place I needed to go to clear my mind. Southern Coffee. Southern Coffee was a basement dive. It wasn't modern, hip, or ever busy. And it was my favorite place to down some paint. Let's down some paint? Especially in the company of the best bartender in the city. Vroom! I gave my address and slouched in the back seat of the taxi cab. I thought a good way to pass the journey might be to chat with the driver. <laughs> Talk or don't. Let's, yeah, sure, let's have a chat with the driver. He was young, not a teenager, but not far off. The redness in his face and a mean scowl told me he was angry. Don't much like driving taxi cabs, I offered. He looked quizzically at me through the rearview mirror before understanding what I meant. No, lady, I like it right enough. Just some bozo for you were in here was giving me hell, because I look like the boy his daughter's going, off, going with. Went off about how my generation was ruining America. That scumbag, scumbag don't know Jack. Sounds like you know more, I asked. I'm no genius, he replied, but you talk to anyone from the last century, they'll tear off your ear for, your ear for just being young. How'd they get so high, I wonder? Given the world in the 1890s like a smooth-running roadster, then what'd they do? Bash it on every curb in sight. Their greed, their war, their politics. Now they give us a ruined clunker, and they're mad at our manners when we grab the keys. Sure. We'll, we'll agree with the angry, angry young guy. I agree with him. The Great War was the hardest fought at, at home and abroad. I said, the old men who put us there had some nerve. He replied hotly, and after those years they tell us to go to get in line. It's a bum deal to me, sister. We're in the information age, and the news of the world is crap. They're just angry we can see their folly. The taxi cab rolled to a stop. Anyhow, the driver said, thanks for letting me blow off steam. Have a nice day, miss. I opened the car door and stepped out. Southern Coffee was an automat diner. Ethel Burgess, the lone waitress, was friendly to help with any inquiry. Of course, if you winked at her right, she'd show you the way to the downstairs toilet where Frankie played bathroom attendant. Southern Coffee had the distinct feeling of home. The familiar smell of mold in that old basement was enough to put a grin on my face. What's that? Frankie had a bond with that old shaker at the end of his bar. I was surprised he hadn't named it. He could sling a mean drink, though he'd only use the good liquor if he liked you. Frankie liked me. Oh, there's a stool. I grabbed the wine bottle on the bar and examined its label. It featured a picture of grapes and the words, Sacramental Use Only. <laughs> Frankie looked at me with a spark in his eye. Go ahead, he said. Give it a swig. Sure, let's take a swig. I grabbed the half-empty glass that had been next to the bottle and swirled it some of and swirled some of its contents between my gums. Bit spicy, ain't it? Frankie asked. 
It's good, I nodded. I shook my head. Too much. It's good! Let's be positive. I nodded and gulped the rest down. It'll cost you too, he said with a smile, and he grabbed the bottle from me, turning it through his hands. Rabbis charge more than a nickel for this beauty. Only this type of Napa wine is made in from that Zinfandel grape. It has a unique aroma. I've been trying to learn more about wine. It seemed everyone knew their stuff but me. I noted what Frankie had said about the origin of the grape as he sat the bottle back on the bar. Since when do you know about grapes? I chided. Frankie let out a belly laugh. Some of these grapes are older than you, Malone, and I've known about them since I was a small tot. It's why I'm so good at my job, you know. Frankie sighed. Too bad more folks can't taste them. That's wi That women's league is the devil. The women's... Christian temperance. Aren't you done with this? Aren't you done with the sauce? The women's Christian temperance. Yeah, they they're the ones who are like against uh, against alcohol in support of the prohibition. The women's Christian temperance union was now under feminist Frances Willard, a positive force for the suffrage of women. But her staunch support of prohibition, along with the union's massive political clout, irked the very wet San Franciscan public. And she particularly wasn't popular with bartenders. No kidding. She's for prohibition. Take a seat, he said. I'll make you something else. He was a big fella. He'd been a decent pitcher. He was a fantastic orator. But knew when he was when to be a good ear, too. For my money, there hasn't ever been, nor will there be, a more loyal barman. I sat at the bar. You got the spooks, PC? He asked. Yours, you're worn as a catcher's mitt. I suppose my exhaustion showed. I want a hundred bucks for nothing, and I can't let it go. I told Frankie about the case, the threatening letter sent to Connor Green, how he assumed it was related to his bootlegging, and his suspicion of Red Redstone Stable. The story took longer than I'd wanted, Frankie showing genuine interest by asking many questions. When I finished, he threw me the whiskey sour he'd been stirring. I took a large gulp and gave a sigh as thanks. Well, Green's case is better than most of what you're given, he said with some enthusiasm. At least it's not more than... it's not more of that adultery bunk. Sure, I replied, but I started with a goal in mind. What's the point in helping a man like Green? Frankie clicked his tongue on his teeth. Lawyer or priest, why does it matter? Let me ask you, are the clients you have now the types you want to help? I admitted they weren't. I told him that I'd wanted more for my detecting life. It could be that Green's case shoots your career forward, Malone. I sighed and stared down at my drink. But my daze was interrupted by the basement door opening, then slamming shut. Oh no. Oh, she looks pissed. Just her mouth and eyebrows looks pissed. A small, blustering woman began marching towards me. She looked younger than... She was wearing a... She looked younger than 25 and was a few inches shorter than my 5'6". I thought her gray trench coat was too large for that small frame, which was when I realized it was exactly like the one that had belonged to... Lewis. She hurled insults at me a while. All I could do was sit and take it until I, she ran out of gas and started breathing heavily. I sat my drink on the bar and looked her in the eyes. I inserted a hello. Yeah, hello, um, thank you for insulting me. What's your name? Uh, hello, I'm Phyllis Malone. How can I help you? Accompanied by a smile as genuine as I could muster. That knocked her off balance. She stumbled over the next few words and I added, And you are? The flame returned to her eyes. Between clenched teeth, I'm the wife of that bum who sneaks into your bed! I asked the cat? <laughs> or did you get the coat or I just gaped? Yeah, the, the cat? But humor wasn't her angle, and she launched into another poetic stanza. And he just left your sty this morning, she finally ended. And that was when I gathered she was Connor Green's wife. Oh dear. Mrs. Green, I'm a P.I., not a homewrecker, and I don't think your husband, in his line of business, would want to bet a dick anyhow. <laughs> Her look was pure incredulity. A woman in that line of work, she questioned, I don't believe it. Prove it, yeah. Uh... Hmm... It's my evidence. My, there's my, uh, notebook, I guess. Or my paper stack. Paper stack? <laughs> notebook? I wrote everything down. Okay, yeah, show her my notebook. 
I open my notebook and flip through the, its pages. You see, Mrs. Green, this is what I do. There's not much more I can show you to prove it. It still took some more coaxing for her to believe me, but eventually she came around. She seemed grateful I'd explained it to her. Apparently she had seen her husband leave my apartment, and, distraught, she had followed me all the way to Frankie's basement and decided to confront me. I suppose I lost my head after what I thought I'd seen, she said, and she began to cry. Frankie, ever chivalrous to a dimpled girl, came around the bar and held her up. Now that's all right, Mrs. Green. Why don't I hail you a cab and send you back home? She agreed, and they walked up the stairs. When Frankie returned, I said to him, You turned night real quick. He snorted a laugh. Aw, oh, hell, we can't have that siren in here. With a torture yelling like that, every street bugger would have come to her rescue. <laughs> Mrs. Green is a torch singer? Well, I learned she was Mrs. Connor Green just now when she came in here. I'd only I'd only seen her as a little little Fanny, singing lead for that jazz band, the Tin Spoon, at the Tin Spoon. The Tin Spoon, I said, Tiny Paul's joint. That's where Green is selling his liquor. Say, you think that's where she met her husband? I laughed. You're the real sleuth, Frankie. He made a sarcastic bow. I shook my head. You're telling me you escorted our little torture out just to avoid a bit of hot water? Frankie flushed and said, What are you talking about, Malone? I was never good with emotions, but it was plain that Frankie had instantly fallen for the girl. Ah. So what if I had more to squeeze out of her? I asked. So what if I had more... Ugh. So what if I had more to squeeze out of her? I asked. Okay, what more could you possibly want from loyal Fanny? She can't have, a, can't have anything to do with Green's mess. Contradict, maybe? I mean, what evidence can we contradict it with? Wine bottle, cocktail shaker, Green's letter... I mean, I can show, show him Green's letter, maybe. Okay, before you came to me, and your gamer will end you. Signed only the small black hand. I mean, yeah, if that's... Hmm. Notebook. Yeah, I don't know if there's actually anything to uh, contradict with. But, I mean, sure, maybe, I mean, Green's Letter is the only thing I can think of that's, uh, kind of related. Oh, how does that prove that she knows anything? He was right, it didn't. I don't see how this, how Mrs. Green is related to any of this he contradict, he concluded. Well, maybe there is more statements? Ah. Okay. Well, she is a singer at the Tin, tin Spoon, where he's doing all the bootlegging. And following her husband, I mean, because she'd suspect infidelity, though, so, yeah. No, that does not, that's not the right thing. Okay, um, we'll, we'll just try following her husband. Mrs. Green followed her husband to my place, I said. Why would she do that? Frankie rolled his eyes. PC, if you were Green's wife, wouldn't would you trust him with anything? I'm sure he's always up to something. I shrugged and stood up from the bar stool. What had just happened was quite the ruckus. It seemed like my cue to move along. What's that though? Once I'd asked Frankie to lend me some cash from that register, he growled so fierce that I decided not to ask again. I didn't think his employers would notice before I got it back, but maybe he just wanted to save me from myself. Bar stools were crooked and worn. My usual one was in the center of the room. I could sit on it for hours if Frankie had a yarn to spin. Of course, the sauce helped keep me in place, too. Okay. Guess we're done talking with uh, Frankie, probably. If I was stuck if I was stuck on the case, a long drink with him might be helpful. Um, all right, well, but said our, our cue is to leave, so... The worn stairs led to the outside world. Leave. Oh, I was heading up the stairs when Frankie called after me. So, what are you gonna do? I've been thinking about my sister, about little Fanny. Hmm, thinking about little Fanny after that row. I supposed even mobsters had people who cared about them, and she'd been wearing Lewis's old jacket, so perhaps Green and Lewis had been closer than I'd realized. I guess I'll take Connor Green's bait, I replied. I've got nothing better on the stove, and he might need the help. Something still stinks, though. Well, what's your plan? Frankie asked. The way I see it, I have three goals right now. Green hired me for a job. Find the guy who wrote the letter. That's the basic part. But you want more? Asked Frankie. I nodded. Green's a shady character. I have to learn about him. Who is this guy? Dig in his past. I can't go back to 
back to him blind. And then there's something about his bootlegging. How'd Green get a connection like that? What What's his source exactly? Squeezing that lemon might give me more juice. <laughs> that sounds alright, he replied. So where is it you're off to? I've got three leads. That bootlegger stable, who Green claims sent him the letter, the tin spoon lounge, where I might learn more about Green's rum running schemes, and Mrs. Green, who could give me more dirt on her husband. Frankie nodded his approval. Well, if you're ever stuck, come back and see me. You can never solve anything without talking it over. I smiled and went up the stairs. I was debating where to go next. Hmm. Stables Barbershop. Well, let's go to well, let's go to Green's house first, maybe. Green's house might contain more clues about his past or some reason a th threatening letter would come his way, and if I got lucky, Mrs. Green would be there to pump with more questions. Alright, let's see. I entered a taxi cab driven by an old man with a mustache. He turned to me with eyes that had a playful glint. Sorry, he said in a rough voice. This is the end of the demo. I can't take you any farther. I didn't know exactly what he meant, but something in that gaze made me understand. Oh, that is funny. That's funny. Now, if you'll keep your eye out for a full release, that'd be swell, he continued. But for now, please exit to the main menu. I nodded and went my way. All right, well, hey, that was really fun. I really like the whole, uh, like, the visual style of the game and everything. And yeah, yeah, it'll def it uh, comes out February 8th, so... I'll probably pick up the and play the the whole thing once it comes out, once the full release comes out. But um, yeah, yeah. So that was fun. So that was the demo for a case of distrust. Thanks for watching. Until next time, rock on.